Hey, sixth grade. Um, big news. Today is a very exciting day, and I'm sorry you couldn't have been in class with me to witness this, but when I opened up my Beachbody On Demand uh, profile, I saw that there are two new workout programs that are available. So that means that next year when you guys have me in class, there are going to be two new workout programs I'm going to be talking about. Fun. Am I right? Which brings me to my next topic. Jokes about fitness. So here's a couple of good jokes I've heard about fitness. Um, let's see. Let's see. Oh, yeah, here's a good one. So I came out of the gym the other day and this cop came up to me and the cop said, how did you get that body? And then I said, I don't know, officer. I just opened my trunk and there it was. It's kind of a dark joke. Um, let's see. Oh. Why was the farmer arrested when he was at the gym? Because he was destroying his calves. <laughs> oh, man. That's a good one. I like that. All right. Oh, before I get to what we're doing today, I want to show you something. Check it out. This is pretty cool. And it's not weird at all, so don't you dare make fun of me. But look at what... I have in my garage. Let's see. I don't know if you guys can see that very well, but down there, that is uh, seeds that I have planted and it's under this light like 18 hours a day and it's covered up by plastic. And basically I created this little device here um, creates conditions for little tiny seedlings to grow into plants that I'm going to use to plant a garden. So I'm going to be growing my own onions. And then there's a few herbs too that, that come with it. Um, so, you know, maybe like in the fall when I go back to school, I'm going to open up my lunch and there's just going to be onions in my lunch. And I'll just just bite into the onions and I'll eat an onion. How cool is that? All right. Um, why am I making this video? I forget. Oh, that's right. Uh, we are doing the review for, oh, the Passion Narrative Study Guide. And we're doing, um, what are we doing? The vocab, I think. Yeah, we're doing the vocab. Okay, so the first one is the disciple whom Jesus loved. The disciple whom Jesus loved is John, right? Pretty simple. Uh, that's a name that John gives to himself in his gospel. John doesn't use his own name sometimes, probably out of humility. Right? He doesn't want to say, like, oh, I was the one at the foot of the cross while all the other apostles were too scared and were hiding. Because uh, remember, John is the only apostle who's at the foot of the cross with Jesus. And, but John doesn't say his name. Holly. Gosh. She always picks the worst times to bark. Anyways, uh, he says, the disciple whom Jesus loved was at the foot of the cross. That's a name that John gives to himself. Why does he give himself this name? Uh, because John was Jesus' closest friend. Right? John and Jesus had a very special relationship. They were very close. All right, next word, praetorium. Praetorium is um, the place where Pontius Pilate sits Jesus on the throne of the judge. So remember, uh, Pontius Pilate is trying to deal with the problem that's before him, the problem of Jesus' guilt or innocence. Pontius Pilate thinks Jesus is innocent. The crowd is saying Jesus is guilty and they want him crucified. So Pontius Pilate places Jesus at the praetorium. 
Praetorium is a fancy word. Uh, it means the home of the king or governor. Um, it also has a judgment seat. So it's basically like the, the seat of power for the local political authority. Right? That's what a praetorium is. Pontius Pilate. Pontius Pilate was the governor of the region of Judea. He was um, appointed by the Roman government. You need to know that he was a pagan. And of course, as everyone knows, uh, he believed Jesus was innocent, but gave in to pressures from the crowd or from the Sanhedrin or who, whatever, whatever uh, pressured him to crucify Jesus, even though he thought he was innocent. The Sanhedrin. The Sanhedrin are the Jewish authorities. So these are um, mostly made up of uh, high priests and scribes. Um, so these are like scholars and lawyers who interpret and apply the Jewish law in the Jewish community, right? Um, the Sanhedrin do not like Jesus. They envy him. Um, they believe he is blaspheming. They don't believe he's the Messiah, obviously. Important note, though, not everyone on the Sanhedrin opposes Christ, right? Remember um, Gamaliel, for example. I think that's how you say his name. Or, sorry, uh, that's from Acts of the Apostles, isn't it? Well, Joseph of Arimathea is also a member of the Sanhedrin, and he doesn't um, participate in the crucifixion of Jesus. In fact, Joseph of Arimathea probably wasn't there when the Sanhedrin condemned Jesus to die. All right, natural law. So natural laws are the laws given to every human being by God. Um, so they're laws that we inherit through nature. As Christians, we believe they have their source in God. Right? So you don't have to be baptized to know what the natural law is. Right? You don't have to believe in God at all to know what the natural law is. Right? We believe everyone is bound by the natural law. It's also another way you could put it. It's the laws written in the hearts and minds of every human being. The narrative of institution, this refers to the parts of the Gospels, um, the part of the Gospels that talks about the institution of the Eucharist at the Last Supper. Right? All right, Simon of Cyrene. Simon of Cyrene um, was a passerby, a traveler, who was um, forced to... We're not really sure how strictly, you know, like what would have happened if he refused. But anyways, he is basically made to help Jesus carry the cross to the place where Jesus is going to be crucified. Because, hello, Holly. Uh, because Jesus isn't going to make it. Right? Now remember, Simon of Cyrene isn't present in all the Gospels, which brings us to the next one, synoptics. So the synoptics are the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Um, these three Gospels are similar to one another in style and content. They are different from the Gospel of John, which uh, doesn't have a lot of the things that the synoptics has, and also has a lot of additional things that are absent in the synoptics. Um, Golgotha. Golgotha uh, is a word which means place of the skull. It is the place where Jesus was crucified. All right, next one. Uh, first precept of the church. So uh, precept means a law or a rule. So the first precept of the church is a law that all uh, baptized Catholics must follow. We are, requ we are required to unless we're given a special dispensation by the bishop. And amazingly, uh, at the time this video is being recorded, in the Diocese of San Bernardino and most, in fact, I think every diocese in the United States, uh, you do have a special dispensation that allows you or frees you from the obligation of following the first precept of the church. 
which is to attend Mass on Sundays and Holy Days of Obligation. Now, the first precept of the Church also includes other aspects to it, but the one I want you to remember is to attend Mass on Sundays and on Holy Days of Obligation and to fast for one hour before receiving the Eucharist. Okay. Now, yeah, that applies to all Catholics all over the world. However, uh, the bishops have given us a dispensation. That means we are freed from our obligation to do this, right? Because you, uh, in order to be required to follow a law, you have to be able to fulfill that law, and we can't go to Mass. So, therefore, we can't fulfill that law. So the bishop said, well, since nobody can go to Mass, the church uh, can't make anyone do anything that they can't do, so you have a dispensation. All right, Paschal Lamb. The Paschal Lamb was a lamb that was sacrificed uh, during the Jewish Holy Days. Um, it goes back to the Exodus when the Jews were being freed uh, from Pharaoh's control, right? The tenth plague. Uh, the Jews would sacrifice the Paschal Lamb. They would spread its blood over the doorway. Um, so the, the Paschal Lamb is a sacrificial lamb from Jewish tradition used to commemorate the exodus why are we learning about the paschal lamb now well because jesus uh, is a sacrificial lamb and the gospel writers make sure to understand that the readers know that jesus sacrifice is like the sacrifice of the paschal lamb all right a gentile a gentile is a non-jewish person at this time right so um yeah, before the advent of Christianity, there were two types of people in the world from the Jewish perspective, Jews and Gentiles. So if you were a Jewish person, uh, that means if you were a male, you were circumcised. Um, or if you were a female, you were born of a father who was circumcised or married to a man who was circumcised. Uh, and then everyone else was a Gentile. So these would be non-circumcised men and their mothers, daughters, sisters, wives, uh, as well as their children, their sons. Um, so a Gentile is a non-Jewish person, or you could also think of them as pagans, right? Pagan people. Uh, now what's important to understand is that after the advent of Christianity, the term Gentile is also used to describe people who have recently become Christians who were not Jewish. So pagans who converted to Christianity would also be Gentiles. All right, Psalm 22, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me or why have you abandoned me? Uh, this is a Psalm that uh, Jesus quotes from while he is on the cross. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? All right, so it's the Old Testament Psalm. Um, and importantly, you need to know that while it's an expression of despair, Jesus on the cross isn't actually despairing. He doesn't think God has actually abandoned him. What Jesus is doing, according to most interpretations, is he is expressing um, or he's experiencing the sorrow of people who do feel like they've been abandoned by God or maybe people who feel that God doesn't exist. All right, uh, next one. Oh, hold on a second. I did something with my screen here. I don't know what I did. All right. Um, give me a second. Joseph of Arimathea. So Joseph of Arimathea is a Jewish leader uh, who gives his tomb to Jesus. All right, so Joseph of Arimathea risks his career and possibly his life by giving up his tomb, which nobody has ever been laid in before, um, 
to house the body of Jesus. So he's a very, very wealthy Jewish person. He's a member of the Sanhedrin. All right, the fourth gospel. This is the name we give to John's gospel to distinguish it from the synoptics and also to show that it was the last gospel written. So interestingly, there's kind of a debate as to whether or not it was Mark's gospel or Matthew's gospel that was written first. Um, more traditional Catholics like myself, we tend to think that Matthew's gospel was written first. Some people think Mark's was. Personally, it doesn't really matter to me because um, what's more important is that we understand that John's gospel was written last. It's the fourth gospel. All right, the centurion. Um, centurion. Uh, this is a Roman soldier he would have been kind of like an officer. He uh, pierced the side of Jesus. So he takes his spear. Remember, uh, you're, they're supposed to break Jesus' legs, but they think he's already dead, and it's really hard to break someone's legs with that big hammer. And so uh, the centurion decides that instead of breaking Jesus' legs, He's going to pierce his side with a lance to make sure that Jesus is dead. So what ends up happening is the centurion um, takes the lance and goes through Jesus' right side. Right? But what happens is the lance goes all the way through and pierces Jesus' heart. Right? So when you stick the lance in the person, you, you want to stick it far enough in so that you stick it in between the ribs pierces the lung, and then pierces the heart. What happens when you're crucified is uh, your heart fills up with blood, and then there's a sac around your heart that fills up with water and other fluids. And so when the centurion pierced Jesus' side, he pierced the heart, but he also like popped that balloon-like sac around Jesus' heart, and so all this blood and water just burst out of his side. All right? Um, and then last is scourge. So, right, that's the last one. Uh, scourge. So to scourge means to severely beat, to severely whip. Usually it's whipping. That's what happened to Jesus before he was crucified. Um, and the, whips, the whipping would be so severe, you're basically half dead by the time it's over sometimes. All right, uh, that's it for vocab. I'll make another video about questions and a final video about what, what the test is gonna be like. See you later.